Mr. Haddas, so as I understand it, you are going to use 15 minutes and then um, Mr. Brown is going to argue for seven and a half minutes and then Mr. Sablone is going to argue for seven and a half minutes. That's correct. Okay. Please proceed. May, may it please the Court, my name is David Hadass and I represent the Department of Revenue. I think it's important at the outset to lay out the basic sequence of events in these cases. The following timeline is common to both of these taxpayers. First, they paid their taxes. In the case of the estate, estate taxes, and in the case of Fleet Bank, corporate excise taxes. Three years later, the statute of limitations for filing an abatement expired. After expiration of the statute of limitations, both taxpayers obtained determinations from the IRS um, in, in the case of Fleet adjusting its federal taxable income for the year in question, in the case of the estate adjusting the value of the estate. Based on those... And then... Based on those... And then there was a technical information release, 03-18. Correct. That said, if you, quote, um, get a refund of overpayment of tax, such as an order change reducing an assessment, it's not affected. So that's also part of this timeline, isn't it? Uh, that's true, although I, I will note that uh, neither taxpayer has alleged that they did so much as even read TIR 0318 or, or relied <coughs> on it. How could they have relied on it? How could they have relied it, on it? It's, it's theoretically impossible for them to have placed any reliance on it. And uh, is reliance a part of that, or is that would we take into account in considering what this meant? Absolutely. They, they, are, <clears throat> they are coming in and saying that uh, this – it is, it is a mere guidance, after all, put out to the taxpaying public to try to well, clarify. it's more than a mere guidance from our point of view, but isn't it, doesn't it go to what the purpose is here? Here you have taxpayers, because they are very large penalties if you pay insufficient taxes. So they do what we hope taxpayers would do, which is to advance their clients' funds, presumably on the advice of counsel, saying, don't worry, because when we get a refund, because we are, we are going to pay perhaps even a little bit more, you will be fully compensated. But at the time they paid their taxes, uh, TIR 0318 wasn't out yet. So no, I understand. At the time, the time they paid their taxes, the statute hadn't been amended. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But asking you about the TIR, why should taxpayers be treated differently depending on who discovers the overpayment? But according to your interpretation, that makes a taxpayer treated differently depending on who, who um, discovers the overpayment. The, the reason is, uh, is a very practical one, and that is that when the department itself discovers the overpayment through one of its own audits. How many audits has it done? The department itself, audits of this kind, as opposed to relying on federal audits? I, I, I don't know. Uh, it's, Less it's, than five? Fewer than five? Oh, no, it's, it's fairly common. Um, it, it's fairly common for the department itself to, to audit taxpayers. It does it all the time. Okay, but why now, for, the, it... for these kinds of, of, of overpayments, I thought, the My... ju I thought the department or somebody made a representation, I believe, to the judge, could have been to the appellate tax board, that the, the department, in fact, relies on federal audits for these purposes. Well, that's absolutely true. It does, it does place some reliance on, on federal some changes. Uh, well, the, it, there, there can be other offsets and other, and other things that the department overlays on, on top of the, whatever the IRS does. But that, that doesn't mean at all that the department itself never audits taxpayers. It's, it's fairly common. Who makes the audit? Why should it matter? Who makes who discovers the overpayment? The, the reason the is is when the department uh, does an audit and reduces an assessment, there is no need for an abatement application. So it's a very practical uh, uh, explanation that the department was trying to put out there that says, if if there is no need to file an, an abatement application, we obviously can't uh, uh, Determine construe the date, the date of the overpayment date of from that date because that date doesn't exist. Mr. Hadas, have you finished the chronology now? You, you started off. You were giving us what happened and when. The the, the final uh, the final aspect of that chronology is that uh, is that the taxpayers actually once they received those IRS determinations actually filed the abatement application 
uh, on, on the grounds that the IRS made the, de the determinations that they made. At that point, the statute had been amended. The rules were different. The, the taxpayers assert that the amendment to section four, Chapter 62C, Section 40, which is the statute we're dealing with here, uh, has, has been applied to them so as to adversely affect their rights. But the first thing that they must show in making such an argument is that they had rights. And clearly, these taxpayers did not have vested rights to interest upon the payment of their taxes. Well, why, when would why? they vest? When would they have vested? A number of things would have to happen before that right vest. Number one, they would have to have grounds for even uh, claiming a, uh, a refund, which, which didn't happen until years later uh, when, when the IRS made its determinations. Second, they would have to petition the, the department to allow a refund. And third... But, but I mean, th that reasoning is circular. They're not going to apply for an abatement until there's been an audit that says you overpaid. You want... You, you have a tax system where you want people, I assume, to pay the Internal Revenue Service and the Department of Revenue the, the full amount that they believe possibly could be owed. Isn't that what we want? You don't want them sure. saying, well, you know, who, you want them to do that. Sure. Then, and there, then and there's an audit, a perfectly straightforward audit, and it turns out that they paid too much. The government has had the use of that money all of the time. The money didn't belong to the government, didn't belong to the federal government, didn't belong to the state government. It was wrongly paid not illegally paid, just wrongly paid, an overpayment. So then they say, now I've got to go through a procedural step to get it back. The way I do that in these circumstances, I think, is to file an abatement, correct? Correct. Because it's a federal audit, which the Department of Revenue doesn't challenge, correct? Correct. correct. So they say, please pay me back my money. And by the way, please pay me for the use of, of the money that you have had, which you said you were going to pay me at the time I made the payment. Correct, but there is no, there's no constitutional right to interest. The legislature, it's purely well, a matter of legislative grace. The legislature can give it, it can take it away, it can dictate exactly how much you get, what interest rate, when it starts. All of that is purely a matter of, of discretion on the part of the legislature. Well, why wouldn't we be governed by the same rules that apply to changes in interest rates of judgments? Before the effective date, you apply the old rate. <clears throat> After the effective date, you apply the new rate. Why, couldn't we, why shouldn't we do that here? We, we actually do do that here, and I, and I uh, thank you for asking that because I want to clarify something that probably wasn't clear in the briefs. One of the changes to Section 40 is, is a reduction in the interest rate. That change does apply uh, as, as, uh, j just as the prejudgment interest case, uh, Porter, which is prominently cited by, by Fleet. It does apply in that exact same way, so that if you have a, a period of time which, sp which, which spans both pre-effective date, which is July 1, 2003, and post-effective date, the taxpayer will get the interest rate that, that, that the pre-amendment interest rate in the pre-amendment period and the post-amendment interest rate in the post-amendment period. But they have and to file their, in your version, they have to have filed their abatement application prior to July. That, one. yes. Yes. If they filed prior to the effective date and therefore, and, and under my scenario, and then it was allowed after the effective date, right. you would have a period of time which, which encompassed I, I, both. I, I, underst I understand <clears throat> why that would apply, but, but it is also, I mean, you, in answer to Justice Cowan's question, you say, well, we'll apply the, um, no, you're, you're doing both. You're applying both when they, when they applied and, and the rate. And that is, that is because interest rates can change. Interest rates fluctuate. They already fluctuate. Every quarter they change based on the federal short-term interest rate. Um, what doesn't change, what can't change, is the quote-unquote date of overpayment. There can only be one date of overpayment. But there was a different date of overpayment. The, the different date of overpayment before the statutory amendment was when you paid your tax, correct? Correct. So you said they have no right, then you slightly changed the language and said they had no vested right, then you slightly changed the language and said they had no constitutional right. 
uh, maybe wrong. I didn't think they made a constitution. Well, well, maybe I, they didn't. All of the above is true. All of the above. Okay. Do they have a statute? I mean, the statute at the time said, if there's an overpayment, you will get interest, whatever the rate was, from the date that you make the payment. And they have made a claim that they relied on that. Not a bad thing on which to rely, by the way, because what it says is, I'm going to get, as I said, really hammered if I underpay. And the penalties for underpayment are enormous. Would you agree with me? Well, I, I couldn't quantify them, but, but, but they, they are they don't, they're not are penalties. Don't, they're not, they are penalties. They're not just – there's an incentive to pay in full. And if somebody says to you, look, you'll get the interest and look at the interest rate and it looks okay, you, you advise your client and you say, you know, pay $2 million more than you should. And that is uh, reliance on the current state of the law, which no one is entitled to do. Laws, laws can change. Um, right, and I would think the same tax accountants and tax attorneys are now taking into account that there may be a long period of time before which uh, you even know that you've overpaid. Can, can we go That's back true. to your chronology again? Statute of limitations <clears throat> expired, you said. And after, at the point it expired, are, are you saying they could not have applied for an abatement? It, 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 uh, their right to apply for an abatement is revived by the uh, by the federal change because there's a specific statute that says once there's a federal change, you have one year from then to, okay. to, to file. So it had expired, so and it then it was expired. revived and under then they Section had this 30. Additional Correct. year. Correct. So the the point about the statute of limitations is this, and, and this and this court could very well. Uh, hold for the department under the very narrow grounds that the statute of limitations expired. These taxpayers are before the court saying, as soon as I paid my taxes, I had vested rights to interest, and a subsequent amendment to a statute affected those rights, and that's, and that's not right. You're saying that the act of applying is what triggers what interest rate is paid? Uh, uh, it, 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 tr it triggers what what date of overpayment we use? The interest right. rate. And why? Sh why should it be? Why should it be the date of applying? Why should that be the trigger date? That that is what the department has uh, has determined uh, pursuant to regulation. The the statute itself merely states the effective date is July 103. Uh, the department uh, said as of that date we will we will apply this statute. Um, if you file uh, before the date, you're going to fall under the old rules. After the date, you're going to fall into the new rules. But why? But the, the, why? The, the why? The statute itself does says, not yeah. have a new date of overpayment. Right. right. No. Uh, that's, that's true. And, it, and, and the question it's is. Going forward, it does. Right. And the question is going forward, as of July 1, 2003, who do you apply this to? They would say, don't apply it to us, only apply it to future <coughs> taxpayers, people who, pay, who actually don't even pay their taxes until after July 1. 2003, which would, by the way, completely defeat the purpose of this statute, which was to immediately uh, produce savings for fiscal year 2004. It was part of the fiscal year 2004 budget. Um, if, if, it was, if it were only applied to future taxpayers, it would be a several-year lag before you saw any significant well, savings. We can, we can take judicial notice that there was a problem in 2004, but there had been a problem for a number of years, and perhaps the, the legislature was saying this year maybe, but in the future as well. And presumably there were some abatements arising in these circumstances, namely following a federal audit that found that there had been an overpayment of taxes, um, you know, that would have fallen within 2004. Yes, because you, you would have been within 2004. The, the, the preamble to the, to, the, to the budget indicates that, uh, that it was immediately necessary to, uh, to, to make some adjustments in the law for, for purposes of, of appropriations, et cetera. Um, so uh, with, with regard to the – just one, one other point with regard can, to can I just Can I just ask you about the language? Is there anything in the statutory history that um, will tell me – that what the legislature had in mind was an abatement that arises in the wake of a federal audit. 
because, as you said, if you're thinking purely of the Department of Revenue, you don't have to file an abatement, correct? Correct. Is the legislature – I mean, there are lots of circumstances in which you file an abatement, <coughs> correct? You, have, you file your taxes, or state taxes, property taxes, whatever they are, and then you say – because that's what the bill says, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Uh, and state taxes is not a bill, but uh, this, does this apply to real property as well? I'm sorry? Does this provision, does uh, Section 40 apply to real property taxes as well? Is it all taxes? <coughs> I, I don't believe so. I okay. don't believe so. Um, I, I think, I think uh, property taxes are strictly under Chapter 59. Yeah, maybe. Um, but there, uh, I, I think to answer your question, there is a specific statute that says in the federal audit situation, you do file an abatement application. There's no ambiguity about no, no, that. No, no, I understand that. But yeah. I just wonder whether in enacting this statute they had this in mind. Uh, th well, there's nothing in the statute itself uh, to, to indicate one way or another on okay. that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Hedans. you. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Your Honor. My name is John Brown. The laws could change, but not retroactively. Uh, this court... It's clear from decisions of this court that legislation affecting substantive rights is not applied retroactively. On here, the taxpayer filed its 1997 tax return in September 19, 1998 and overpaid its taxes by $710,000. And under the rules then in force, it was entitled to overpayment interest at the same rate that deficiency interest applied if it had been underpaid, and that those rules applied through Ju Ju July 1, 2003 when the statute was changed. That was the overpayment, and interest accrued on that overpayment until July 1, 2003. Excuse me, the, interest, interest accrued? When did it start accruing? It was started accruing from the date of the overpayment, from September 3, 1998. And it would accrue until the law changed. So in other words, it's building up there for it, you. It's not, I mean, the, the, the department takes a position that the the, the refund is the refund is only a refund. Oh, you only have a right to it when the department approves your application. That's not even that's not even that and one's that's wrong. It's not even the position they're arguing. If they argued that position, then they would be applying the entire statute retroactive relief to everybody, both the interest, the reduction in the interest, and the re, and the elimination of compounding, which were features of the computation hmm. of interest prior to the change in 2003. They're just arguing a different rule. They're just saying it's when you file the abatement application. Um, they're inconsistent in their positions. In well, one I thought, position... No, go ahead. I, I, I saw that they were, there was an inconsistency in the position. I didn't have a chance to ask the question because it seemed to me that they were saying there's no right to a refund until it's... There's no right to interest until a refund is actually made, right. which would... Inf okay, go ahead. One... one it, I, think it's, I think the position is just wrong because you are entitled but, to the end. We could but, have but, but the state isn't a bank. You don't advise your clients, look, you know, overpay, you get a good rate of interest from the state for the next five years or three years, then we'll file an abatement. It's not a bank. And even banks change their rates all the time. A a ab absolutely. I, I think Chief Justice Marshall was correct in that under the old law, taxpayers were, 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 could overpay with some degree – if could pay their taxes with some degree of certainty because a deficiency rate of interest was the same as the overpayment rate of interest. But Under how can you rely on that? How can you rely? I mean, what's the basis of reliance on that? This isn't an investment. This isn't a bond. It's the state can change interest rates at any time it, it, it wants. This is a, a, legis, a statutory grace. This is not a right. It, we, I have no question that interest rates can be changed, and they will affect conduct. They will affect the willingness to pay. Uh, to pay an amount which is which is which is might be slight might be overpayment to protect against penalties, they'll change that conduct. There's no question about it from 2003 going forward. The point is, mm -hmm. can you retroactively eliminate 350,000 of interest that was accrued as of July 1, 2003? That's what the position is by saying that that this, that this statute applies to abatement applications filed after July 1, 2003. We I, accept... I, I take it, Mr. Brown, the, the answer in part to Justice Court is it's not that you're banking it with the federal government, the state government, or anybody else in order to make interest, but you are protecting yourself from having to lose a not insignificant amount of money. Correct? Yes. It, 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 I, I, 
did not put it correctly. It is conservative. You pay on a conservative basis so that right. you do not attract deficiency interest and penalties. M Mr. Brown, may I, ask I, I, excuse me, I, I, don't, I know that this isn't the issue in this case, but uh, could you clarify something for me? Can a state constitutionally set different interest rates for uh, amounts owing as, for deficiencies as opposed to, abatement, as opposed to abatements? Yes, I, I, I believe they can. That I mean, the interest, the interest statute is a waiver of sovereign immunity, yeah. and, I, and they can set different rates that they have now done, and it does change conduct, because essentially under the law now you don't get any interest on a refund until you file an abatement application. It's essentially a zero interest position today. Could you, while you're educating the court, educate me on one point, which may seem obvious to you? What triggers? What triggered in this case, or what generally triggers an audit of this kind of um, uh, return filing? In other words, what triggered the federal audits here? I'm talking both to you uh, and to uh, the, uh, the Fournier estates. I, I did not understand the question. There was a federal audit, yes. correct? Why? Well, large financial institutions are constantly under federal audit. There's always a federal audit. Okay. Um, it, it, nothing abnormal. It, it, there, there, there's never a period where they're not under audit. Um, can I ask you a question on another subject? Can a TIR bind the commissioner if it's plainly wrong? The TIR, well, no. If the, 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 if, if the statute were otherwise, the, I should say the TIR is not binding, but the, but the statute the statute here is the effective date provision, which says this act shall take effect on July 1, 2003. And then the TIR came along and read the statute exactly the same way we're reading it, that it applies to interest accruing after July 1, but, but 2003. But if we decide that it's plainly wrong, can it bind the commissioner if it's plainly wrong? No. If it, were, if, it were plainly, if it were plainly wrong, it would not bind the commissioner. But I don't see how it can be plainly wrong when it's, when the stat, it's not interpreting a taxing statute. It's interpreting the enactments, the provision, that, the effective date provision. The effective date provision just says this act shall take effect on July 1, 2003. And I, I think, frankly, if you understood this court's decisions, by Justice Graney and Fontaine and, 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 the, and, the, um, and the earlier Cotalassi case and in the Porter case dealing with prejudgment interest, the, the legislature would, I would have had every expectation that this would, would be applied prospectively. They could have said if they wanted it retroactive, they could have said that. If you took any examination of this court's law with respect to the retroactive application of statutes, you'd know right away that this is going to be applied prospectively. Because they didn't, they could have put in language saying it should be retroactively applied. They, they, they could have, they, and they have many, many times they have done so. Could I ask you to clarify, just to make sure I understand uh, the basic calculation here. Your position is that from the date of payment up to uh, the tax payment up to July 1, 2003, you get interest at the former rate compounded. Correct. Okay, and then you accept that as of July 1, 2003, you're operating under the new statute, so you get no interest until the abatement application is filed, and then from that date to the date of refund, you get the simple interest at the lower rate. That, that, that's correct. Okay. Okay. And, and it has the result of treating taxpayers with similar overpayments equally, whereas the commissioner's position has, a, has, the, has the disadvantage of treating taxpayers quite different depending upon who, taxpayers who have had said the same amount of old payment for 1997 would be treated entirely differently, depending upon whether they filed an abatement application on June, by June 30, 2003, or, or the day after. And, and this court was very conscious in the Porter case, dealing with prejudgment interest, not to let that circumstance occur. And I take it in part that at least with, you know, the Fournier estate, for example, the, the, the federal tax audit could take one year, two years, three years, four years, five years. The taxpayer, the estate payer, has no say over how long the audit is going to take, correct? That, that's correct. The, the, in, in a sense, you, you don't have much control over how long the audit takes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Blown. Mr. Sablone. Thank you, Your Honors. My name is Jonathan Sabloni, along with my co-counsel, Steve LaRose. We're honored to be here today representing the Fournier estate. Your Honor, let me just start by adding uh, two issues, or at least two items, to Mr. Hadassah's timeline. The first, of course, I want everyone to remember, we are dealing here with an estate tax, and the first important issue 
was the passing of Mr. Fournier in January of 2000. More importantly for our issue here, this abatement issue, this, excuse me, the statute of limitations issue has to be dealt with. The timeline is incorrect. With respect to the Fournier estate, and I can't speak as to the banks, but with respect to the Fournier estate, the Department of Revenue wrote a letter to the Fournier estate three years after the payment of the tax and specifically said the statute of limitations is about to expire. Would you please sign the enclosed forms which give the department the ability to come after you for penalties should an overpayment be determined by the, should an underpayment be determined by the IRS? The Fournier estate returned those forms signed to the Commissioner of Revenue. When that happened, by operation of statute, the statute of limitations was extended so that the Fournier estate could get a refund. So we absolutely categorically reject that at any point a statute of limitations expired. Now, Your Honors will note, none of this is in the record, and there's a reason for it, and that's because the statute of limitations issue was never raised by the Department of Revenue, either in the court below or in its main brief in this case. The first time the word statute of limitations have ever appeared in this case is in the reply brief of the Department of Revenue. Therefore, we think it's waived, and we would ask Your Honors to ignore it. But should Your Honors be interested in the substance, with respect to the Fournier estate, there was no expiration of the statute of limitations. Now, again, we are dealing with two very different cases here. Although it's the same statute we're talking about, I'm dealing, the Fournier estate is dealing with an estate tax. That tax was paid in October of the year 2000. And it was significantly overpaid. It was overpaid by $2 million plus dollars. And there was a darn good reason for that, because as Justice Marshall, as Chief Justice Marshall has pointed out, overpayments got interest back under the statute at that time. And that's why you overpaid, so you could make interest off the state? No, Your, Your Honor, you don't overpay to make interest, but you certainly take that into your calculation as to how much you're going to pay. You, t you, you it, pay as much as you conservatively think you are due, because if you underpay, you, you, you have a big problem If on you your underpay, you are hit with substantial penalties. If you overpay, now I'm talking about not in October of 2000, if you overpay, you get interest back. So a rational taxpayer, no, is not going to treat the Commonwealth as a bank and make a loan, but a rational taxpayer is not going to be concerned about overpaying 20, 30 percent, 40 percent if necessary under a conservative analysis because the taxpayer knows that if that overpayment is found, the money is going to come back with interest. Mr. Sablon, could certainly you answer? that knowledge? I mean, knowing that the state can change the interest rate pretty much whenever it wants. The interest it, rate is, is not what's at issue, right? It's uh, whether they could say you can have no interest. Th that's correct. Number one, what we're talking about, again, is the retroactive application. I think, in this case, the whole reliance argument by the Department of Revenue is a bit of a red herring. It's as if the Department of Revenue steals my wallet and then says, well, you weren't relying on that money to do anything. It's not a question of reliance. The law exists as of the date the payment was made. And this notion that the statute is not retroactive simply because an abatement application has to be filed, I think, is, is beyond the pale. So, so you've essentially, you, you have a, the equivalent of a savings, well, not the equivalent, but I'm trying to make an analogy. You have a savings bank passbook into which you, you put the overpayment. It's, it's, it's accruing interest. Uh, the moment you put it in and the moment you made the overpayment, it's accruing interest at whatever rates the bank is, is, is saying it's paying on a month-to-month -month basis. And then here in 2003, they changed the rates, so that's the rate from that point on. I, I, I would look at it slightly differently, Your Honor. I think on October 24th of the year 2000, when the Fournier Estate made its payment, the amount of tax that the Fournier Estate owed on that day was a sum certain. We didn't know exactly what it was, but it was a sum certain. That number isn't going to change over time. That number is a sum certain. Turns out the IRS finally determined that sum certain three years later. But when that money was paid, that number was certain. An overpayment is conservatively made, again, not because you're treating the Commonwealth as a bank, but because you want to be conservative, and the statutory scheme at the time encouraged the taxpayer to be conservative. Mm. Now, Mr. Sibline, I don't want to get you off point, but could you answer with respect to your client, was there a particular reason why a federal audit was triggered? Was it the size of the estate? Was it 
I, I can't answer definitively, Your Honor. I can tell you that the, si the, the size of the estate was at issue here. There was a $30 million plus gross estate. That usually triggers some interest by the IRS. There was also, um, I believe, and I was not involved in it, there was some litigation within the estate which might have also had that effect. But it's not uncommon for an estate of that size to be audited. And it's certainly not uncommon for uh, the IRS to determine there's an overpayment. Which brings me to the TIR, which is much more of a case sort of, in my view, in my client's case. Because remember, at the time, and this case is now historical anomaly. I think we can all agree to this. At the time, the Massachusetts estate tax was a pure sponge tax on the federal tax. There was no separate statutory scheme in Massachusetts. So the Department of Revenue never conducted audits of estates. They relied on the IRS, and I believe that representation was made, Your Honor, in the It was made in your client's case, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so what we had at the so this notion that somehow the TIR doesn't mean what it says is ludicrous because at the time the the Department of Revenue relied upon the IRS and had to accept the audit numbers. The simple fact that they forced the estate to go through the ministerial act of filing an abatement application doesn't change the fact that they were bound by law to pay that money back under their own regulations and under the statutory scheme as it existed at the time. The Commonwealth has every right, I think my client would certainly agree with this, going forward to change its uh, interest calculation and to change whether it gives interest or not. But the operative date isn't the filing of an abatement application because that assumes rights that have already vested. What the Commonwealth had a right to do in July of 2003 is say going forward, for payments made after July 2003, we're not going to pay interest back. That gives rational taxpayers the ability to make an economic decision that makes sense. Namely, while I might overpay because I'm afraid of the penalties, I'm going to be much more careful in how much I overpay but so that you, when I get did, there, I'll know. But let's assume your client paid the tax on whatever day, mm -hmm. overpaid because felt he would be protected in this way, earn interest. Mm -hmm. The next day, the legislature passed a statute eliminating interest. So you're saying, uh, I'm vested because I should get the interest that was in place at the time I made my payment, even though I can't rely that that interest will continue from year to year. Are you saying the state can't change the interest rate? I'm saying the state can't change the interest rate retroactively to apply to money I've already paid in. And, Your Honor, you reminded me of a very important issue which I wanted to raise. My client certainly doesn't agree that the interest stops in July 2003. My I, client I didn't think you did. takes that <laughs> position. Yeah. That, is not, that is not the law. Our, my client views it that the statute continues to run because we're bound by the pre-July 2003 statutory scheme. Thank you, Mr. Sublime. Thank you, Your Honor. We'll take a short break. All right.